I should say good morning, shouldn't I? All right, well, uh, it's, this is a little weird for me too, but uh, we'll, we'll continue on. Uh, I want to uh, welcome both you that are here and those folks at home that are watching. Thank God for you and uh, your, uh, your attendance. Uh, a couple of things to remind you of. One is, of course, we're not having services on Sunday mornings uh, and won't be for a while until this is all over. But uh, I do want to remind you that we will have a prayer time every evening uh, here in the church from in the sanctuary from 6 until 8 every night of the week. Ten people in here and we have room for six people out in the EV Center. So we'll be able to meet there in prayer, Avenel and, and Thad will be here and, and, uh, and out in the EV Center. So we'll be able to do that. So with that being said, uh, you want me to scripture and, okay, scripture reading and prayer. Since we don't have Elder of the Week, I will be doing that. I'm in Psalm 34. And uh, I'll read the first uh, eight, uh, 14 verses. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes it boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all round those who fear him, and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves uh, many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Please join me in prayer. Our Lord and our God, you are an awesome God. We thank you so much for your watch care in our lives. We thank you for keeping us safe. Lord God, I ask you to be with every person here and watching this uh, video. Lord God, just bless them. Let them hear and understand the word that you're going to speak today. Thank you, God, for all that you do. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. While we seek birth and beauty 
come to worship our Lord and our God through our tithes and offerings. And while we're not going to take an offering here uh, in the sanctuary, we encourage you to, if you're watching this at home, to go to the donations page at faith or fccvideo.org, the donations part of that, and if you choose to, make your donation there. Also, you have uh, availability. The church office will be uh, open Monday through Friday from 9 to 3. And you could drop by uh, your tithe or offering as you choose to. You know, we're, we are still uh, ministering to the area, Ocean Shores, Grace Harbor County, and beyond. And we're maintaining that ministry throughout uh, Ocean Shores. So we, we ask you to contribute. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, you are an awesome God, and I thank you for every heart that's attending today. Lord God, be close to us. Bless the the hearts and minds of the people attending. And Lord God, bless every gift. Multiply it and send it out in your loving care to the people in Ocean Shores, Grays Harbor County, the state, and even the world. Thank you, God, for all that you do for us. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. <laughs> Just before the light of the morning Just before the whisper of dawn Did I hear your voice in the stillness Gentle and strong Calling me to come to the quiet Linger in your garden of grace Feast upon your banquet of mercy Sweet to the taste In this place I will dream of heaven Dwelling on things above Near to your throne Next to your heart, lost in your love In this place I will dream of heaven Gazing at things unseen Knowing one day 
I will awake, live in the dream. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the online service of Faith Community Church. I trust out there that you have a Bible with you. If you do not have a Bible, I will need that clicker. Thank you, Ray. If you do not have a Bible with you, um, I'll give you like 30 seconds. Go and get one right now. All right. Okay, time's running out. All right, your time is up. I know that was less than 30 seconds, but hey, you should have had one with you already. So if you have your Bible with you, please open to the Gospel of Matthew. We are going to continue along in our series that we began um, a long time ago as we've been going through the books of the Bible. And so our next book, we're stepping into the New Testament, and we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew. So if you're there, uh, Matthew chapter 4 is where we will begin. Um, we're going to be looking at what is known as the Great Journey. The great journey. There's a lot of ways to unpack the Gospel of Matthew. There's a lot of ways that we can approach it, and there's several different themes that we can see through the Gospel of Matthew, but there's one in particular that I think is important, and that theme really takes us on a journey. It takes us from the time that Jesus says, Come and follow to the time that he says, go and make disciples. How do we get from a life that says, come and follow me, to a life that Jesus is willing to send out and say, go and make disciples of all nations? Well, that's what the Gospel of Matthew really helps us to see. It's the great journey. Now, I know a lot of people here on this day are not gathering together in the collected worship services, and as we cope with the situation, one thing is true, Nothing has changed in the work of Christ. We still do what God has commanded, though we have to do it a little bit differently in the moment that we're in. And though we're doing a lot of services online, and though we're doing a lot of connectivity where we cannot actually interact with each other physically, yet we can still interact with each other in ways where we can spread the gospel. And the Gospel of Matthew, it is written for the purpose of building those who first come to faith in Jesus Christ to a place where they can take what they know and bring it to the world. And that's what we're trying to do. And that's the call of the church, is to go into all the world. And that's what we're going to find in Matthew, is that the mission continues. So if you have your Bibles open, you've had plenty of time now to go and get it. And for the seven of you that are here in the sanctuary right now, you had one right there in front of you. So we're going to read Matthew chapter 4 very quickly, and we're going to pray uh, verses 1. Let's see here. We're actually going to be reading not verses 1. We'll start with verse 18. Start with verse 18 and following. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon who was called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Let's pray. God Almighty, as we have come to this hour to understand and to grapple with your word, we come into the beginning of the New Testament. And Father, let this be a beginning for us again as we're launching into this new style ministry, as we're trying to figure out how to minister your word to your people. Help us, Father, to understand what to do in the time that we're in, that we should be a go-and-tell type of Christian. Help us, Lord, to answer the call, to respond to you in a way that is glorifying and honoring to you, and to use our lives, Father, for the purpose, as you have said to the disciples, to, make fishers, to, be, to be fishers of men and to go into all this world with that desire. We want to honor you in all that we do. Bless this service and bless all who are listening right now, Father, 
And it could be that even right now from coast to coast, people are listening to this. So bless them, Father, and open their hearts to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first thing that I want to point out here is that the Gospel of Matthew, as I said, takes us from the call to come and follow to the command to go and tell. And this is the great journey of every believer, to navigate the world with the Lord Jesus and follow him in faith. So what are the marker stones? What, what do we decide really kind of hits for us as the places that mark out our journey, that tell us where we're headed or that we are headed on this great journey with the Lord? And the first marker stone is that you have to answer the great call. There are four greats that we're going to see. And the first is that you have to answer the great call. And that's what we just read in Matthew 4, verses 19 and 20. Jesus comes along the side of the boat, and he sees these people fishing. And he says this great call, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. See, God is calling you out taking you to become a go-and-tell disciple. But before that happens, it has to begin right here with the question, will you follow Jesus? That's, That's the question that is upon the heart of every person in the world. Will you hear the call to follow Jesus? See, because without that, if you just ignore Jesus, if you just say that he has no value, no authority, no purpose in your life, you're just going to go about your day, you're going to you know, live in your uh, quarantined life at the moment, and by the time all of this is done, your spiritual life is going to remain quarantined. Jesus calls us out. See, one of the, the markers of the church The word church literally means the called out ones, the ecclesia, the ones who are called out of the world to belong to Jesus Christ. And look what the apostles did. Look what they did. This is really remarkable. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. The greatest call you will ever know is the call to follow Jesus. And with abandon, the disciples left everything, and so must our response be as well. You cannot be encumbered by the world and hope to follow Jesus. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn. It's not going to be on the board for you, but I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12. It might be a very familiar passage for you. But in Hebrews chapter 12, we read this starting with verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. See, this is the call, that we cast aside everything that would keep us from following Jesus, and we follow him with abandon. We, we abandon our world for the purpose of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that he takes us out of the world. We're still in the world. Jesus said that though you're left in the world, you're not of the world anymore. There was this other fella, a rich fella. He had it all. And having it all, he came to Jesus. And he said, what one thing must I do to inherit eternal life. What do I have to do? That's a good question. And he had great wealth. And Jesus said this, you know the commandments. He said, yeah, I've kept them all since my youth. And Jesus said this, this is a great statement of our Lord. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. What was this man lacking? I mean, Jesus is not saying that the only way to follow him is to be philanthropic. He said, you know, salvation is found in philanthropy. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, cast aside everything that is the weight that keeps you from following me. 
Sell your possessions. They are owning you. Sell your possessions. Get rid of them. Anything that is hindering your willingness to follow Jesus Christ, cut it off. Sell it all and follow me. The end of that story is a sad one. Because the end of that story is that Jesus saw the man walk away. He went away sorrowful. Why? Because he had great wealth. He was, he, was, he was wealthy, and he couldn't leave it all behind. I heard a man tell me one time, well, why wouldn't Jesus want wealthy people to follow him? Then he can fund their ministry. That's not the point. Jesus doesn't need our funding of ministry. He needs our faithful obedience. That's what he needs. We don't call people to give tithes and offerings because Jesus in heaven needs some funding. We do it because God has commanded our willing, faithful obedience to him. And it's the evidence that we are unwilling to cut ourselves away from the world that we're unwilling to follow Jesus. That's, that evidence is for us that there is no room in our heart to be obedient to this very first command. Follow me. The disciples left their boats. James and John left their dad. Peter would say this later on. He would tell Jesus, we have left everything to follow you. So I'm asking you, what are you willing to leave to follow Christ? What are you willing to set aside for the purpose of obedience to this first call? Will you answer the great call to follow Jesus? Or will you tell Jesus that you will follow him provided that he allows you to take everything you want along the journey? That doesn't work. If Jesus says, cut it off, cut it off. If Jesus says, obey me in this, obey him. The call to follow is where it all begins. This great journey does not begin except that it begins here. And it begins here for the purpose of bringing us to the place that he wants us to get to. Which takes us to our next point. Is that you need to voice the great confession. You need to voice the great confession. And I want you now to go to Matthew 16. Go to Matthew 16. This is a great, great experience that Peter was having. In Matthew 16... Jesus is asking a question. You know, it seems like it's taking longer to get to the pages there. Let's see. here. I know it's in here. I've seen it before. In Matthew 16, Jesus is asking a question. In verse 13, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, that's a good question. What Jesus is saying is, what's the latest news? What's the gossip? What's the word on the street about me? Who do people say that I am? And of course they said, well, some are saying John the Baptist. Basically, he's, he, by the way, if you didn't know by this time, John had already been killed. And so maybe they think he's come back to life. Or one of the other prophets, and maybe uh, you're Elijah or Jeremiah. And then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. How you confess Christ is born of your view of him. How you confess Christ is born of your view of him. How do you know the Lord? In what capacity do you see him? Is he a good man, a man of power, a religious icon? Or does he dwell in your heart as the king of kings and the Messiah of promise and as the son of God? Who Jesus is comes only by revelation of the Father. Jesus would say that next. My my Father has revealed this to you, he would say in verse 17. But the truth of all of this is that if you do not have this great confession in your heart concerning Christ, you do not know him correctly. You cannot say that you are willingly following Jesus if Jesus is not Lord, the Christ, the Son of God. See, a lot of people have an imaginary Jesus. 
They have a Jesus of their own divine design, I should say. They have a Jesus that's less than divine. They, they have a thought of Jesus that is not who he really is revealed. See, but the only way to know Jesus is based upon the revelation of the Father. Do you go to the Word of God to find out who Jesus is, or do you suppose that you know him according to your own imagination? Well, there were some who did in the Gospel of Mark. In the Gospel of Mark, there were several groups there in Mark chapter 3. The first was his family. You don't have to go there. I'll tell you about it. The first was his family. In Mark chapter 3, and I think it's in verse 20, 21, somewhere in there, his family came along and were trying to get Jesus because Jesus had lost his mind, they thought. That's who they saw Jesus as, as their elder brother who had lost his mind. So he was delusional. A few sentences later, Jesus is dealing with this demoniac, and the Pharisees come along. And they say, it is by the power of Beelzebub, that is by the prince of darkness himself, that you cast out demons. So mom and dad and the boys and the girls of his family all think he's delusional. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and all of the religious leaders thought he was demonic. Who do you say Jesus is? What do you believe about Jesus? Some of the things that I hear is that he's a man of power. He's a good teacher. He's wise. He is he's a philosopher, a religious icon. If you don't know him, if it's not from the revelation of the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord, you don't stand on this journey. Jesus is leading us as the King of Kings. Peter, Paul, I think it was, Paul would say this. No one can say Jesus is Lord apart from the Spirit of God. And no one can say Jesus is cursed who belongs to Christ. You, you cannot confess him except that you have him in your heart. And you cannot have him in your heart unless you're willingly wanting to follow him as he is for who he is in any direction he wants to go, with any purpose that he has planned for you, it doesn't matter. You cast aside all other authority except the authority of Jesus Christ in him alone. That is what it means to confess Christ as Savior. See, we have a lot of people confessing Christ and believing that he's their Savior when they have no regard for him at all. What they want is Jesus to be an insurance salesman. And he comes along and he offers them hellfire insurance. And they want to buy into it. And they want to say, you know, I could get into this fire insurance bit. I don't want to live for you. I don't want to obey you. I don't want to listen to you. I have zero regard for your commands. I don't want to be a part of your fellowship. And I really don't like the church a whole lot. But I would really like to get out of hell. You won't. Many, he said, and I've shared this before, it's perhaps one of the most frightening passages of Scripture. Many will say to me on that day, Matthew 7, Lord, Lord, did we not do all of these things for you? Oh, we were so religious. We prophesied in your name, and we cast out demons in your name, and we performed mighty acts in your name, and Jesus will say clearly to them, depart from me. You workers of iniquity, I never knew you. It's a great story, the seven sons of Sceva in the book of Acts. It's a great story. You should go there and find it for yourself. I can't remember the exact chapter and verse, but the seven sons of Sceva were these uh, Jewish boys who had seen Paul deliver somebody from a demon. And they thought, we want to get in on this. Looks like a good thing. So they found themselves a guy that was demon-possessed. 
And they come up to the guy and they say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, we command you to come out. Well, now the demon-possessed guy takes a look at these seven guys. He says, well, now, Jesus I know. And I've heard about Paul, but who are you? They were not in fellowship with Christ. And it says that the demoniac, the demon-possessed man, beat them, so they left naked and bleeding. Seven against one. And they couldn't take the guy. Well, that's another story. But the fact is that they had no real understanding of who Jesus really is. Apart from a true confession of Christ, from a true understanding of who Jesus really is, Paul would say it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. From now on, he says, we regard no one according to the flesh. And here's the key. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. You take no further steps until you know Jesus in truth. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is the true and faithful Savior. He is all that we need. He is God in human form. He is all of these things. And as Peter confessed, as we must confess as well, he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And at that point, at that point, if you are willing to confess Christ as the Son of the living God, it changes every step you take after that. You cannot call Jesus Lord and then not step in faithful obedience to everything he commands. Which brings us to our next point. In Matthew chapter 22, which is you have to embrace the great commandment. You have to answer the great call. You have to voice the great confession. Let me, let, me, let me step back for just a moment real quick. Why voice it? Why not just believe it in your heart? Why not just say, well, I, just, I, I, just, I don't need to be vocal about it. I don't need to voice it. Well, you can't confess anything without actually verbalizing it. That's kind of the idea of confession. Confession is an outward expression of what you believe. It's the verbal proclamation of everything you hold to be true. When you go to court and you're confessing, you're coming in agreement, verbal agreement, acknowledgement of that which is true. And when you confess Christ, there has to be an outward verbal acknowledgement. And, and you say, well, why, why does it have to be verbal? Because the, the mouth overflows with what the heart holds. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you hold Christ in your heart as King and Lord, how could you possibly remain silent? I mean, when we talk about the people we love, we often voice our praise and adoration and honor and glory for those that we love with great flourishment. And yet we have to stay silent about Jesus? Tell me that you love Jesus and let me hear it. One of the greatest experiences I had, I was at a conference many, many, many years ago. And one of the conference presenters, the keynote speakers at this conference, was staying in the same hotel I was staying in. And I was sitting down in the um, hotel little lobby area where you have your continental breakfast with the cheap eggs and the bad cereal. And he came and sat down and he had a cup of coffee and he sat right across from me. And I was surprised. And he sat there and he looked up at me and he said, could you do me a favor? I said, sure, I'd be happy to. Tell me about Jesus. Now here's a guy giving a presentation about his walk with Christ. He, I mean, the, the guy I think was just about as old as Moses. And he is giving this presentation about his journey with Christ, which was overwhelmingly glorious. And he's looking at me, 
and he wants me to say something, he says, just tell me about Jesus. I want to hear how much you love him. I want you just to tell me. I love, he says, to hear the stories of those who are walking with Christ. And I told him, I said, but you are so far beyond me. He said, yeah, but your journey is different than mine. We follow the same Jesus, but you've walked a different road. I want to hear about your road. And so then we began this wonderful conversation that lasted until the conference began. You verbalize about those you love. You talk about the people you love. You voice your confession of Christ. Paul said it in Romans, that we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, yes. But it says, but we confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord. Because with the mouth one confesses and with the heart one believes. That's where it's at. And if you're an unwilling participant in the confession of Christ, I'm going to say, and it's not an axiom and it's not absolute, but I'm going to say you are hard-pressed to make anyone believe that you follow Jesus if you're unwilling to confess him. But that confession of regard for Jesus Christ leads us to the commandment that he has given us. We voice our great confession, then we must embrace the great commandment in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 and following, if you're in your Bibles with me still. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Of course they did. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, that is Jesus speaks back to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. If Jesus is Lord, then his command is to be obeyed. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Authentic love is the evidence of a life redeemed. In a world filled with the darkness of hate and fear, this commandment that sums up all commandments is the brilliant light that shines with the radiance of God. There is enough, my friends, there is enough superficiality in this world. Love must not be one of them. Oh, but we banter the idea of love quite a lot. We talk about love in such superficial ways. We, we, we make light of love, and we minimize love, and we, we dismiss love, and we, we consider it to be something that is a feeling and an emotion, and it can come and go and rise and fall like the tide. But love is not like the tide. Love is the ocean. And though it may rise and fall a little here and there, yet it remains ever steadfast. See, love is the full expression of our willing obedience to Christ. You cannot say you're obeying Christ and walk in this world without it. It's impossible. You can't do it. You cannot go into the world, and especially in this time, in this period that we're in right now, with all of this uh, quarantine and, and self, oh, I don't know, quarantine stuff, whatever they call it, I have no idea, where you've got to distance yourself from Andrew, and you can't even shake hands anymore, and God help the kindergartner that needs a hug. You know, I mean, you, how do you love people when you can't touch them? Well, my friends, be creative a little bit, will you? Decide that other people are more important than your current crisis and go and meet their needs in a way that expresses the love of God. You love God with all your heart. That is everything that beats within you. Everything that, that it literally is the, the, the essence of the soul. It's, it's, it's the Greek word cardia. Yes, it means the very, the very 
nature of your life itself, with all your heart. You love him with all your strength. With every fiber of your ability to endure in life, you love God. With all your mind, you, you, you purify and you purpose your thoughts to be toward Christ. Your heart, your soul, your mind. In another text, it says your strength. And then you love your neighbor as yourself. John would say that you cannot love God whom you have not seen and hate your brother whom you have seen. There's two scripture passages, and if you're writing anything down, um, then write this down. John 3.16. Raise your hand. I know you just did. There you go. Raise your hand if you know John 3.16. All right. Raise your hand if you know 1 John 3.16. See, now, now, see, now the problems come. I want you to write those two passages down because John 3.16 tells us how God loves us. 1 John 3.16 tells us how we should love each other. And both of them are sacrificial. But you have to look it up yourself. I'm not giving them to you. There you go. If you need a rabbit trail, chase the rabbit there. But both of them are how to love sacrificially. Jesus tells his disciples, by all this, by this all people will know that you are my disciples. John 13, 35. That you are my disciples. Why? If you have love for one another. You know, there is no evidence apart from love to verify that you belong to Jesus Christ. Religious idioms and maxims and memes and posts and, you know, spiritual thoughts and deep Wisdom, none of that. Love is the maxim that God has purposed to be the evidence of a person walking with Jesus. How do you love God? You love him in obedience. Whoever loves me, says Jesus, will keep my commandments. How do you love your neighbor? I love this. Jesus gives then a parable of the good Samaritan. The man who had no relationship with the guy that was dying on the road. None at all. The the priest went by one side and the the Levite went by the other side. They abandoned the guy. They left him for dead. The, 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 The Samaritan comes along. He has no relationship with this guy. And he does everything he can to take care of his needs. He couldn't do it all, but he could do what he could. That's love. That's your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? Anybody along the journey of your life that needs you to love them in Christ. He, he or she, that's your neighbor. It doesn't matter who. It doesn't matter if there's somebody that's for you or against you. It doesn't, to give you kind of the, the whole issue of love, Jesus says to love your brothers. Jesus says to love your neighbors. Jesus says to love your enemies. Do you want the evidence of real divine love in your life? Love your enemies the way God loved you when you were his enemy. You understand that you were his enemy? Paul says that while we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You could paraphrase it this way. For God so loved his enemies that he gave his only begotten son. This is the evidence that God is looking for in us. You can't fake it. You, You can't pretend. You can't say that your view of love based upon the world's ideas of love or what God expects? No. This is why it always comes back to what Jesus said. You go back to the very beginning of all of this and you start with following Jesus and obeying his commandments and then walking in love according to his word, not according to our imagination, not according to our opinion. God doesn't want my opinion of what love should look like. I could just go to his word and find out. It's not hard. It's all here. Everything I need is right here. 
This is the great journey. But we haven't quite stepped out into it yet because we've got one more step to go. This is where it all goes into the world. So far we haven't quite got there yet, so go to Matthew 28. And yes, you know where I'm going. We've had the great call. We have had the great confession. We have had the great commandment. And now we have the great commission. We have to live the great commission. Pick it up with verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always." to the end of the age. This, my friends, is where Jesus is trying to lead us all. Your journey through life must be marked with the footprints of the gospel. I always liked the idea that in the book of Ephesians, when Paul was laying out what the armor of God looks like, he said, your feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. So everywhere you walk, you better start leaving gospel footprints because you are ready to take the gospel into the world. You're never going to get to this point if you never begin at the beginning. Have you heard the call to follow? Do you understand who Jesus really is? And understanding that, are you willing to obey his commands? Because that's what it takes to get us here. These are the marker stones to get us to a life that's on a journey with Christ. See, the operation of the kingdom is to share what you know with who you know so that they will know the Savior. Let me say that again, and you're going to read it. There it is on the, on the board for you. The operation of the kingdom of God is to share what you know with who you know so that they will know the Savior. The final instruction of the Lord before departing this earth was for us to take the gospel on the journey and make disciples as we go. This is where our journey actually begins. Yes, we begin in obedience to follow the call of God, but God wants to send us out. God has purpose for us to go into all the world. God wants us to be the feet of the gospel and go in his authority. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And now he's commanding us, commissioning us to go. Go where? Go to all the world. To do what? To make disciples of all nations. How? By baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So we go into all the world for the purpose of making disciples and the process of leading them and teaching them to walk with Christ. That's what God has given us to do. When I was in the military, I was being transferred from Colorado to California. And in California, I called ahead, and I talked to who would have been my, my uh, sergeant. And I told him, so I said, Sergeant Allison was his name. I said, Sergeant Allison, my name is Airman Duncan. I would be coming to California to Castle Air Force Base from Colorado. He says, no, you're not. I said, well, yes, I am. He said, no. He said, we're getting you diverted. You're not going to be coming to California. We're going to get your orders changed. I said, Okay. I had another month and a half before I was to leave. So I waited, and I waited, and I waited. And I called Sergeant Allison about three weeks out. I said, um, still coming to California? He said, no, you can't be. I said, my orders say California. These are the only orders I've got. And so when the time of my departure had come to leave Colorado, the only orders I had ever received was to go to Castle Air Force Base, California. No other orders were given. There were seven others who were supposed to go to California with me. They all got diverted. 
Every one of them got new orders and shipped to different bases around the country. Me, my new orders never came. And so I got in my car and I went to California. And when I got there, Sergeant Allison said, well, what are you doing here? I said, look at my orders. This is all I had to obey. He said, well, you're right. All right, so welcome to California. My friends, these are the final orders Jesus has given us. He's left his final orders before he leaves the earth is to tell his disciples, go and make other disciples. This is the great commission. And there's no other commission coming. There, there's, there's no other orders that will rescind these. The only thing left for us to do after these orders are fulfilled is to go to heaven. But while we're here, we obey them. This is what God wants for us. But he doesn't leave us powerless. Acts chapter 1 tells us this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God empowers you for the purpose of fulfilling the great commission. And this is the journey that all Christians must take. From the point of entry where we come to the place where Jesus says, follow me. All the way to the end where he says, go and tell. It's come and follow to go and tell. That's the journey. That's the great journey that all of us are on. If you have not, and if you're listening to this right now, and if you've not ever yielded your life to come and follow Jesus, let me encourage you right now. Let today be the day that you step through that door and you tell Jesus, I will follow you. Get to know who he is according to his word and recognize the, that that confession of Christ must come. That you see him according to his word, not according to the opinions of men. And in recognizing who he is, you understand his authority and you see his command and you obey it. To love God with all you are and love you as you would want to be loved. And then to step out by faith and fulfill the commission that God's given you. You have one job in this world that God has given you. As you are going, literally means in the process of going, wherever you're going, if you want it that way, wherever you go, go to the golf course, make disciples. Go home, make disciples. Go to work, make disciples. Go to church, make disciples. Apparently we're not allowed to go to church. Well, there's a few of you here, that's okay. As you're going, wherever you're going, however you're going, make disciples by telling people what you know about Jesus. And so Paul closes us with this. This is what we're going to close out with in Philippians chapter 3. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Will you press on? That's the question. Will you press on in all that we're dealing with today? Will you press on? The mission hasn't changed. The message hasn't changed. The methods, maybe they changed a bit. But that's okay. Because we take the gospel any possible way to the world at large. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for all that you've given us. We do pray, Father, that you would bless us in this season of separation, that we would not be disconnected from one another, that we would embrace and hold on to each other, that we would strive 
and purpose our lives to remain connected and not hide away in our quarantined lives and not accept that this is going to be permanent, but long for the time when we can be back together again. Bless us in this time, Father, with faith and endurance and power, with joy, which is our strength, with the love of Christ. Wrap us up, Father, in your love and give us your grace in this season that we would be faithful servants in a time of crisis, leading others to believe in Jesus. In his holy name we pray, amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for watching. If you've been watching online, I do appreciate it. I pray that God's word blesses you tonight, this morning, this afternoon, whenever it is that you've seen this. And for those who are able to gather, the seven of you who are here in the building today, thank you for coming. God bless.